pick up a book and read Open up the cover and read Read all the words inside Read Travel to a place and read Open up your mind and read Read, read, everyone read Read Pick up a book and read Open up the cover and read Read all the words inside Read Travel to a place and read Open up your mind and read Read, read, everyone read Okay, this time you have to say read Here we go Read Pick up a book and read Open up the cover and read Read all the words inside Read Travel to a place and read Open up your mind and read Read, read, everyone read Read, 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 everyone read share one of my favorite springtime classics, The Tale of Peter Rabbit by Beatrice Potter. Now this morning in our story, we are gonna meet Peter and his brothers. And Peter is a super independent, adventurous young rabbit who decides to not take mom's advice and venture into the unknown. So this morning, we are gonna find out if sometimes mama knows best. of Peter Rabbit. Once upon a time, there were four little rabbits and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. They lived with their mother in a sand bank underneath the root of a very big fir tree. Now my dears, said old Miss Rabbit one morning, you may go into the field down the lane, but don't go into Mr. McGregor's garden. Your father had an accident there and he was put in a pie by Mrs. McGregor. Now run along and don't get into mischief. I'm going out. Then old Miss Rabbit took a basket and her umbrella and went through the woods to the baker's. She bought a loaf of bread and five currant buns. Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, who were good little bunnies, went down the lane to gather blackberries. But Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. First, he ate some lettuce and some French beans, and then he ate some radishes. And then, feeling rather sick, he went to look for some parsley. But around the end of the cucumber frame, whom should he meet but Mr. McGregor? Mr. McGregor was on his hands and knees planting young cabbages, but he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling out, Stop! Thief! Peter was dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. He lost one of his shoes among the cabbages and the other shoe among the potatoes. After losing them, he ran on four legs and went faster so that he might have gotten away if he had not unfortunately run into a gooseberry net and got caught by the large buttons on his jacket. It was a blue jacket with brass buttons, quite new. Peter gave himself up for lost and shed big tears, but his sobs were overheard by some friendly sparrows who flew to him with great excitement and begged him to try to free himself. Mr. McGregor found a seed which he intended to put on top of Peter, but Peter wriggled out of his jacket just in time 
leaving his jacket behind. Peter rushed into the tool shed and jumped into a watering can. It would have been a beautiful thing to hide in if it had not had so much water in it. Mr. McGregor was quite sure that Peter was somewhere in the tool shed, perhaps hidden underneath a flower pot. He began to turn them over carefully, looking underneath each. Suddenly, Peter sneezed. Ka-choo! Mr. McGregor was after him in no time. He tried to catch Peter, who jumped out a window, upsetting three plants. The window was too small for Mr. McGregor, and he was tired of running after Peter, so he went back to his work. Peter sat down to rest. He was out of breath and trembling with fright. He had no idea which way to go. Also, he was very damp from sitting in that can. After a time, he began to wander about, going lippity-lippity, not very fast and looking all around. He found a door in a wall, but it was locked and there was no room for a fat little rabbit to squeeze underneath. An old mouse was running in and out over the stone doorsteps carrying peas and beans to her family in the woods. Peter asked her the way to the gate, but she had such a large pea in her mouth that she could not answer. She only shook her head at him. Peter began to cry. Then he tried to find his way straight across the garden, but he became more and more puzzled. Presently, he came to a pond and a white cat was sitting, staring at some goldfish. She sat very, very still, but now and then the tip of her tail switched as if it was alive. Peter thought it best to go away without speaking to her. He had heard about cats from his cousin, Little Benjamin Bunny. He went back toward the tool shed, but suddenly, quite close to him, he heard the noise of a hoe. Scratch, 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 scratch. Peter scuttered underneath the bushes. But soon, as nothing happened, he came out and climbed upon the wheelbarrow and peeped over. The first thing he saw was Mr. McGregor hoeing onions. His back was turned towards Peter, and beyond him was the gate. Peter got down very quietly off the wheelbarrow and started running as fast as he could go along the straight walk behind some blackberry bushes. Mr. McGregor caught sight of him at the corner but Peter did not care. He slipped underneath the gate and was safe at last in the woods outside the garden. Mr. McGregor hung up the little jacket and the shoes as a scarecrow to flight heighten the blackbirds. Peter never stopped running or looking behind him until he got home to the big fir tree. He was so tired that he flopped down upon the nice soft sand on the floor of the rabbit hole and shut his eyes. His mother was busy cooking. She wondered what he had done with his clothes. It was the second little jacket and pair of shoes that Peter had lost in two weeks. That evening, Peter was not very well. His mother put him to bed and made some chamomile tea. She gave a dose of it to Peter. One tablespoon to be taken at bedtime, she said. But Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail had bread and milk and blackberries for supper. I think Peter probably learned that sometimes Mama knows best. Thank you for joining me for the reading of the tale of Peter Cottontail. Remember to keep watching videos like this so we can keep learning together. You can watch lessons daily on STPPS TV or our website at stpsb.org. Hope to see you soon. Thank you.
Since 1985, alligator ranching has been a part of Louisiana's diverse culture. In fact, Louisiana has set the standards for alligator ranching across the globe. In 1965, the Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries decided to make it illegal to kill alligators because they saw that the population was declining dramatically. What happened was the population didn't really increase very much because the honest people quit killing the alligators, but the poachers started killing the alligators because they were allowed to go into a new industry with no competition. By 1985, they concluded that the thing that needed to be done was take the alligator eggs out of the marsh. So Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries created the program that exists today, and that program is that the ranchers go out into the marsh to harvest the eggs. The end result is we're harvesting about 350 to 400,000 eggs a year, and that is allowing us to raise those alligators to a size of approximately four feet, at which time we release alligators to the marsh. Every alligator that's ever harvested has to have a tag on its skin. The Wildlife and Fisheries charges $4 for that tag, and that is where they get their funding to run this amazing program of protection. A lot of work goes into alligator ranching. One of the most important parts of it is gathering and hatching the eggs. Leave mama alligator alone with her eggs. Only six to eight out of a hundred eggs will hatch and grow to become a four foot alligator. We go out in the marsh and we take the eggs from mama alligator. When we take those eggs, we usually take them all. Collecting eggs can get pretty dangerous. I have one about nine foot long, in fact. Uh, I estimate around nine foot. She's a big gator. And um, I broke about every stick I had, everything in the boat, over her head. She wouldn't back down. Uh, she got about halfway in the boat with me and ended up smacking her right on the tip of her nose with my hat. And my hat saved my life that day, more or less. We have all been faced with this country's economic problems, but alligator ranchers have been hit especially hard it's very difficult to sell an alligator skin right now. Those who buy the alligator skins to ultimately have them made into products, they aren't buying right now. The tanners are reducing their, their, their production. The ranchers don't really have the opportunity to reduce what they have. They can reduce their harvest of new eggs. They can slow the input of new product into the market but we have a two-year supply of alligator on ranches growing right now that has nowhere to go. I think over the next six months to a year, something's going to give, and hopefully it's to the benefit of all. Alligator ranching is an exciting business, but there's more to it for the ranchers. It's about their love of wildlife. It's a pretty rewarding job, and uh, I don't know, I just got an extreme passion for Louisiana and for the for the South in general and, uh, and for conservation. I've uh, been dealing with reptiles and animals for about 15 years now and uh, I love it. Hello everyone, my name is Miss Upchurch and I am a St. Tammany Parish Public Schools ESL instructional coach. I'm so glad you could join me today. In this lesson, we are going to learn about prepositions. So let's get started. What are prepositions? Prepositions can be used to describe a location, a time, and or a place. They can also be used to show the position or location of one thing to another. So let's look at the pictures that are on our screen. These are the prepositions that are most commonly used in the English language. So we have under, the cat is under the box. We have between, the bird is between the boxes. We have out or close to, the cat is out of the box or close to the box. We have in or inside, the cat's in or inside the box. Above, the bird is above the box. Behind, the cat is behind the box. On, the bird is on the box. And then we have in front of, as in the cat is in front of the box. We are going to focus on three of our prepositions um, because our English learners 
struggle with these the most, so we're going to get more clarification on these, which are between. The bird is between the boxes. El pájaro está entre las cajas. The next one that we're going to work on is in or inside. The cat is in the box. El gato está entre la caja, en la caja. And then you have on. The bird is on the box. El pájaro está en la caja. We're also going to work on some other pictures that would give us more of a clarification on how this is working. So let's go ahead and get started and practice with them. So we have pictures and sentences. So let's see. Morgan stood blank the TV stand and the plant. Morgan stood between, in, or on. If you chose between, you're correct. Morgan stood between the TV stand and the plant. Good. Next picture. The kids sat between the car, in the car, or on the car. Good job. It's in. The kids sat in the car. What are they doing now? They stood between the table, in the table, or on the table. Good, it is on. They stood on the table. Something they should not be doing. <laughs> Next one, the dog. The dog sat blank the kids. Between the kids, in the kids, or on the kids. Good, it's between. The dog sat between the kids. So let's look at the milk. Where does the milk go? The milk goes in the fridge, the milk goes on the fridge, or the milk goes between the fridge. If you chose in, you're correct. The milk goes in the fridge. Now, if you, got, if you chose on, I want you to think about it this way. You're closing the refrigerator doors, and the milk is on top of the refrigerator. Good job. Let's go to the next picture. So now what are they doing? The kids play blank the trampoline, between the trampoline, in the trampoline, or on the trampoline. Good job. It's on. The kids play on the trampoline. So the next thing we're going to do is that we're going to use a website that we have on our additional resources to practice learning English. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to St. Tammany Parish Schools, the school board website. You'll click on that. Then you'll go to remote, remote learning resources. You'll scroll to the bottom where we have additional resources and then you're gonna look at Games to Learn English. This is a pretty good website that would continue to help you practice. So we're gonna go and then we're gonna go on prepositions. Now I'm gonna start on the slow one just because it gives us more of an idea of what we're doing and kind of helps us, especially if you're just beginning, that'd be something to, to help you with. So let's do it. Put the cushion on the sofa. So cushion, you have to figure out which one's which. So the cushion goes on the sofa and the prepositions that you're using is on um, all of them and not just practicing the ones we practiced today. Put the lamp between the sofa and chair. The lamp. Put the plant on the left of the sofa. The plant. Put the bag on the right of the chair. So let's say I make a mistake and I click on the cat. And it's going to look. It tells me it highlights. So good. So now I'm looking for what? It says the bag. Okay, well, I chose the newspaper. Nope, I'm wrong. The bag. So look, that's the bag. And we're going to put it on the right of put the chair. Put the picture above the chair. Same thing. If you click, it's going to help you. So picture. Put the keys under the chair. So I made a mistake and I put it under the table. It gets it back and it says under the chair. So I've got to go put it under the chair. Put the newspaper on the chair. Newspaper on the chair. Put the cat under the table. Put the tissues in front of the sofa. So this is the sofa and it goes in front of. Put the books above the sofa. Books. Put the candle on the table. My candle goes on the table. 
put the remote under the sofa. And under the sofa. And it goes to the next round. Put the scissors on the left of the computer. So you could go through each round and it's going to help you and it's still going to give you a little bit of ideas on where you put stuff and you're just playing the game as you're going and we highly recommend you to keep going so that you can practice and then I'd like you to go back and do it without the help and just do just playing and that would help you continue to learn about your prepositions. Now we've come to the end of the lesson for today. Remember that when you're at home and you're learning English, especially um, our ESL students, if you're learning your English, make sure that you're practicing in English, you're reading, um, if you're watching TV, make sure you have it in English and you can put the subtitles in your own language, whether it's Spanish or Vietnamese or Arabic, whatever is better for you. Um, and that you're practicing with your, your family. If you talk to your friends online or if you're talking to them on the phone, please make sure that you're continuing on your English skills. That would help. Um, thank you for watching as we learned about prepositions today. You guys did a fantastic job. So keep continuing and practicing at home and using the additional resources that we have. Remember to keep watching the, the videos like this one so that we can all continue to um, keep learning together and together. And you can watch lessons daily on the STPPS TV or on, your, our, on our website at stpsb.org. And I hope to see you again soon. Y'all have a wonderful day. teacher and band director in St. Tammany and today I am going to be teaching you all about pitch. I'm going to teach you what a pitch is. After that we're going to talk about pitched and unpitched instruments. Then we're going to learn what makes high pitched instruments and low pitched instruments. What makes them play like that and then we're going to play a game called up down. It's a listening game where you have to listen to the pitch and tell me if it's going up or down. Now, first things first, what is a pitch? A pitch is just how high or how low a sound is. A pitch is how high or how low a sound is. Now that you know what a pitch is, you're going to go with Miss Hales and learn about instruments that can make pitches and instruments that can't. Hi friends, my name is Miss Hales and I'm a general music teacher for St. Tammany Parish. And this is my friend George Gershman and my cat Ash. Today we're going to teach you about the difference between pitched and unpitched instruments. A pitched instrument is an instrument that can play both low and high notes like this. pitched instrument is an instrument that can only play one pitch. It can't play both low and high, like a drum. Do you think that you can find the difference between pitched and unpitched instruments? Now let's play a quick mini game. Can you sort these six instruments into pitched and unpitched? Three of them will be pitched and three will be unpitched. Remember, Pitched is an instrument that can play high and low notes. Great job! If you guessed that the guitar, the trumpet, and the recorder on the left were pitched, and the drum, maraca, and tambourine on the right were unpitched, you were correct. If you guessed that all three of these instruments were unpitched, give yourself a pat on the back. Because even though some of these play a little bit higher, and some play a little bit lower, each one can only play one pitch. If you guessed that all three of these instruments were pitched, very good job. All of these instruments can play both low and high notes. Let's check it out. Do you think a cat is pitched or unpitched? Let's take a look. 
they're pitched. All right, now let's move on to what makes an instrument sound high or low. When an instrument is bigger, it's going to sound lower. And when an instrument is smaller, it's going to sound higher. Let's first take a look with these didgeridoos. This one is very long, so it will sound very low. This one, however, is pretty small, so it's going to sound pretty high. This frog rasp is a little bigger, so it should sound a little lower. And this one is a little smaller, so it should sound a little higher. All right, I've got a tuba and a trumpet. Which one of these is going to play very high? And which one of these is going to play very low? Take a look, think about it. Let's find out. Here's the tuba. Oh my goodness, the tuba is so big, it plays very, very low. So, of course, let's check out the trumpet. The trumpet is so much smaller, it plays so much higher. You can even do a quick experiment at home where you find two objects that are similar, but a different size. The bigger one should always sound lower, and the smaller one will always sound higher. Let's take a listen. Can you find anything that does this? The last instrument that I'm going to show you is a trombone. The trombone changes its pitch by changing its size. And it's the only instrument that does that like this. When the trombone becomes bigger, the pitch becomes lower. When the trombone becomes smaller, the pitch becomes higher. Here, let me show you. Trombone becomes bigger pitch is lower. When the trombone becomes smaller, pitch goes higher. Right? Follow me with your body. Ready? Now we're going to play a game called Up Down. Here's how it works. You're going to hear an instrument change pitch. If the instrument changes pitch higher, I need you to point up, stand up, or you could draw an arrow up. If the instrument changes pitch lower, I need you to sit down or point down, or you could draw an arrow down. Let's see how many in a row you can get right. Ready for round one? I'm going to play everything two times in a row, higher or lower. Ready? Higher. My pitch started low and it went Higher. If you pointed up or stood up or drew an arrow up, good job, pat yourself on the back. For these next few, I'm just going to point up or down after I play them. Good luck. way up here and it went lower. All right, one more. Let's be real tricky. Did I go 
higher or lower? Higher. Boom. All right, let's keep going. Ready? Another round, but on piano. Same rules, higher or lower. Higher. Lower. All right, one more. Lower. All right, one more round, but let's make it a little trickier. I'm going to play three notes in a row, and you got to tell me if they are going higher, one, two, three, or lower, one, two, three. Ready? Do your best. I went lower. I started way up here and I went down. So if you said lower, good job. All right, let's do another. I went high. I started way down low and I played my three notes going higher twice in a row. Last one. Ready? I'm going to try to trick you. Listen very close. All right. I started and went down. But then what did I do? I went back up higher. If you got it, good job. Pat yourself on the back. Thank you so much for watching. Today we learned what a pitch was and we played a listening game with high and low pitches. Keep your eyes on the St. Tammany Parish District webpage and the YouTube channel for more great resources like this. Thank you again for watching and have a great day. is Stephanie Russo and I'm a St. Tammany Parish public school math teacher. I'm so glad you can join me. In this lesson we're going to practice math skills such as sorting, patterns, arrays, and making equal groups. 
Today, we are using plastic eggs, but items like jelly beans, cereal, or candy can work well too. So the first math activity is sorting by color. After we sort the eggs by color, we can practice making patterns. We're gonna focus on repeating and growing patterns. The first pattern is an AB pattern, where it repeats AB, 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 and so on. Let's try this one. Purple, pink, purple, pink. Purple is your A, pink is your B. Can you figure out what comes next? Very good, a purple and a pink to complete our AB pattern. Let's try another type of pattern. It's called an ABC pattern, where it repeats ABC, ABC, and so on. Let's try this one. Purple, pink, green. Purple, pink, green. What comes next? You guessed it. It's gonna continue on with purple, pink, and green. Let's try growing patterns. Patterns that increase or grow according to a certain rule are called growing patterns. In this pattern, we have purple, green, purple, purple, green. What do you think comes next? That's right. Purple, 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 green, where the purple is the growing part. Our next activity is to create arrays to add and multiply. An array is a group of objects arranged in rows and columns. We can use arrays to show repeated addition. Multiplication is repeated addition. A strategy would be to count the eggs in each row. We have four eggs in three rows. So four plus four plus four equals 12. We can also count by columns. We have three eggs in each of the four columns to give us three plus three plus three plus three, which also equals 12. Since multiplication is repeated addition, we can say we have four columns of three or three rows of four. Four times three, three times four, which gives us 12 eggs. Our next activity is to practice division skills with equal groups and interpreting remainders. After my egg hunt, I was able to collect 25 eggs. I have three baskets and I wanna put equal amounts into each basket. How many eggs would be in each basket? Can you help me find a strategy to figure it out? One strategy is to put the same number of eggs in every basket until I run out of eggs. Let's try it. Hey, wait a minute, I have a leftover egg. Does that mean one of the baskets gets more eggs than the other? No, in this case, it's just a leftover egg and each basket has eight eggs. So everyone will be happy with the same number of eggs. Thank you for watching as we learned how we could practice our math skills like sorting, patterns, arrays, and making equal groups. You did a great job. Remember to keep watching other videos like this one so we can all keep learning together. You can watch lessons daily on STPPSTV or on our website at stpsb.org. See you again soon. Hi, I'm Coach Donnelly with St. Tammany Parish. And in today's lesson, we are going to learn about cardiorespiratory fitness, I'm going to teach you a new athletic event called the triathlon and then show you how you can do your own mini triathlon at your house. Cardiorespiratory, that's a pretty big word. Do you know what it means? Let's break it down and learn together. Cardio, what do you think that means? If you were thinking heart, great job, that's correct. Cardio means heart. Now what about the second part, respiratory? If you were thinking respiratory has something to do with breathing or the lungs, absolutely correct.
cardio, respiratory, heart, and lungs. So when you hear your mom or dad or big sister or brother or aunt or uncle say they're going to go do cardio, they're not going to go exercise trying to build big strong muscles. They're going to try to make their heart and lungs a little more healthy. Can you think of some cardio respiratory activities? Can you think of some activities that really make your heart and your lungs work hard? I'll give you five seconds. How many did you come up with? Here are a few that I thought of. Swimming, a great activity, really makes the heart and lungs work hard. Running, especially if you're running for longer distances, maybe running for 15 to 20 minutes in a row without stopping. That's a really good cardiorespiratory activity. How about riding your bike? Sure, we could ride our bike for a long time, especially if we don't stop pedaling and coast. If you're riding that bike, you're working your heart and lungs. All three of those are great cardiorespiratory activities. Did you think of any different ones? If so, great job. Now, one sport that combines all three of those great cardiorespiratory activities into one event is called the triathlon. That's another big word. Let's break it down. Triathlon. Tri. T-R-I. I've seen that in other places before. I've seen it in triangle. I've seen it in tricycle. So tri, see triangles have three corners, tricycles have three wheels. I bet tri means three. And athlon is from the ancient Greek meaning sporting contest. So this is a sporting contest with three different events all in one. It should be a great challenge for our cardiorespiratory activity. Now triathlons are put on all over the world and there are four different types with different distances, ranging from sprint triathlons, where you swim about a half a mile, you ride a bicycle about 12 and a half miles, and you run a little bit more than three miles. And then the Ironman, the biggest, hardest cardiorespiratory activity ever, where you swim 2.4 miles, then you ride a bicycle 112 miles, then you go run 26.2 miles. The world record for the Ironman triathlon is 7 hours and 45 minutes. That means someone did swimming, biking, and running for 7 hours and 45 minutes without stopping. Well, I'm not ready for that. But I can show you how you can have your own little mini triathlon at your house by yourself. You want to learn? Now, if you have a swimming pool and a bicycle and a nice area to run, and you have an adult that can watch you, you can create your own mini triathlon. I don't. I don't have a swimming pool. So what I'm going to do is show you guys how you can do a mini triathlon on your own. The first event is swimming. Coach, I don't have a pool. What can I do? We can do an exercise called swimming. We're going to lay on our bellies and then we're going to flutter our arms and legs just like we were swimming. So when we're doing our swimming exercise, this is what it looks like. Stay on your belly and pull your arms and legs up off the ground. Swimming is the first event in a triathlon and biking is the second. It is the longest event in the triathlon with the Ironman biking portion being over a hundred miles. So they swim for 2.4 miles, then they ride their bike for 112 miles. My goodness gracious. Well, if you don't have a bike or a safe place to ride your bike, you can do a bicycle exercise with our mini triathlon. Just lay on your back and pump your legs like you're trying to ride a bicycle. Notice that my legs go in and out. My knees are going up and down. I'm not trying to just kick my feet. I'm pushing my legs like pushing the pedals on a bicycle. So that's the bicycle exercise. Now running, we can have two options. If you have a place where you can do a little running, like a yard, like I have here, you can run to one spot and come on back 
Or, if you don't have those, just run in place. Since I have a little area, I'm going to do a shuttle run. I'm going to run there and then run back. Let's see how that looks. Now, let's think about how we can put together our mini triathlon. The first event is going to be swimming. It's the shortest event, so we're probably going to do this for the least amount of time. I was thinking maybe 10 flutters with your hands and feet. So we'll get on our belly and flutter. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So when it's time for swimming, that's what I'm gonna do. You could choose to do a little bit more or a little less. The second event is the bicycle, and that's the longest. So I'm thinking maybe 30 of our bicycle kicks. Let's look. When it's bicycle time, we'll do 30. Remember, pushing in and out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. 20, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So that's 30 bicycle kicks. The last event is the run. I'm thinking we're going to run there and back, there and back. That's what I'm going to do. If you're running in place, just run in place for maybe 12 seconds. Okay? Let's put it together. Are you ready to go? Three, two, one, swimming! One. Now that's one round. How many rounds can you do? I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Remember, you can find lessons just like this daily on the St. Tammany Parish YouTube channel. Just search for St. Tammany Schools. You can also find a bunch of additional resources on the St. Tammany Parish website. Until next time, have a great day.
Here I am at the bayou. We're going to see if we can find our state reptile, the alligator. The American alligator tends to live in freshwater lakes, rivers, and swamps like this one. Alligators rely on their environment to regulate their temperature. Whew, that was a big one. Number two. Number three. Four. The American alligator is a reptile, which means it lays eggs, breathes air, covered in scales, and is cold-blooded. These animals eat fish, turtles, snakes, and are even known to eat some fruit. The alligator has many teeth. It has 74 to 80 teeth and can lose up to 2,000 in its lifetime. We are now ready for our alligator craft. You'll need two sheets of green construction paper, one sheet of white construction paper, a writing utensil, scissors, glue, or tape. With our first sheet of green paper, we were, are going to cut four strips, all the same size, and the extra will be a little thicker. We are going to start with the body of our alligator. And how we're gonna do that is making loops. So I curve the paper up, put just a little bit of glue, hold it for 10 seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then I repeat the process with the other papers, linking it through and fastening the loop. have the body of my alligator. We are now going to begin the head. You have this extra piece, the thicker piece, and you're gonna fold it in half. And it's gonna be the head. But what is this alligator head missing? <gasps> you're right, teeth. I'm gonna cut off a piece of white paper that is about the length of the mouth. And you want some open because we're going to glue it down. And then you're going to cut zigzags for the teeth. Because alligators have really sharp teeth for eating its prey. So I just go up. <laughs> down. And then I have my teeth. I'm then gonna fold it. And I could have given myself a little extra space here. So I fold it down. So now I have this kind of ledge. And I'm going to put some glue. It might just be easier to put it on the actual mouth. And set it down. We are now ready to glue our alligator head to the body. Hmm. What is our alligator missing now? Oh yeah, I guess some legs and some eyes, huh? We're going to draw our alligator feet. She's hiding, then I'm gone. She's 
See the bells from by your shed, the love is sad again. I now have my alligator legs and I'm going to glue them on to the body. Let's see how this little guy turned out. Oh, super ferocious. All it's missing is its eyes. Uh, you can get as creative as you want. I'm just gonna draw a little dot size and some holes for the nostrils. All right. That is our Louisiana State Reptile, the American Alligator.